Yeah, thank you, and it's so great to be back here in PyTorch event. I was just uh, reminiscing with my friend, uh, Joe Spizak. Uh, you know, I think the last time I was, or the first time I was at PyTorch event was in 2018, and that was in a much smaller space. We even had a makeup room back then and a makeup artist that was fun. But anyway, it's really an exciting time to see how much machine learning has scaled since then and what is really the future, right? And with language models, we're seeing this very fast, rapid progress. You know, the question is, is that plateauing? Is that done? And then, of course, the other question is, is language all we need? And um, many people think for super intelligence, it's just language. I disagree. And because really the understanding of our physical world, right, the understanding of the world around us, not just the world that is visible to us, but all of those invisible processes that happen at different scales is really essential for us to make scientific progress. To come up with new inventions, new discoveries, we need that broad physical understanding. So language gives you those high level ideas, but really the ability to simulate, model, come up with new designs, come up with new control policies requires this notion of physical understanding. And that to me can start all the way from atomic or subatomic levels, right, including quantum effects. You think about how molecules interact with one another, how reactions happen, how proteins bind with drug molecules and other ligands. And you can go all the way to planetary scale and say phenomena that happens all around us, like weather, you know, extreme weather events like hurricanes, heat waves. How can I model those? So you have like not just like language of fixed vocabulary when it comes to physical world, you have this enormity in the scales they span, right? So we are talking about uh, huge like 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 15 orders of magnitude that span between these scales and standard machine learning is unable to capture that. Why? Because standard machine learning assumes that you have phenomena of a fixed size. So if you work on transformers for language, you already assume the fixed vocabulary and you assign tokens based on that. If you're working with image and video models, uh, like in many domains, and typically you assume a fixed resolution. Because to our eye, it's all right if it's a reasonable resolution, right? Because we are only looking at visible objects and you don't need the fine details. But that's not true for scientific research, for physical understanding, because understanding how molecules interact at this very fine scale is important. It leads to macro scale effects. And that's where we've invented neural operators which expand the notion of neural networks to function spaces. So what does that mean? So if you look at the picture here of trying to model how the clouds move, right? So that's fluid dynamics. Uh, we already know Navier-Stokes as an equation to capture that. But if you try to use a standard neural network to do that, you have to decide what the resolution is. And then if you zoom in further than that native resolution, it gets blurry. And that's what you see on that extreme end. Like you can't capture more details than what resolution you picked during training. But this is harmful for effects like hurricanes because you need to capture the fine scales. And so what would be much more natural is to have a model that can be run at any resolution. So you can give it data at multiple resolutions. You could add physics constraints at a finer resolution than the data, because let's say you have satellite data and other sensors, you know, you only have a limited resolution in which you can measure the hurricane, right? But we know from physics, we know from Navier-Stokes that there are constraints that can be imposed at a finer resolution than the data you observe. And we can do all of that with neural operators because by design, it assumes that the input and output can be at any resolution. 
So that's why it's called an operator because it's a mapping between two function spaces. So the input is a continuous function uh, in a continuous domain. Uh, the output is also a function on the continuous domain. But what you see are discretizations, right? So you can take samples from this continuous function at any resolution and the model can handle that because it has learned this mapping between continuous functions. And so this flexibility is really important when we think about physical phenomena. And this is again the example of that fluid dynamics where we can train at low resolution uh, things like velocity, right? So how quickly does this fluid move? Uh, and then you can say at inference time, I want to run inference at a higher resolution. And with standard neural networks, this just doesn't work because its resolution is fixed. You could say, I'll take my standard neural network and do interpolation on top, like a bilinear interpolation. So you just do a fixed way to say what is the values in between. And that's the red curve when you see there is severe distortion at the resolution that the model never saw because it gets it wrong, right? Because a standard unit or a transformer is not designed to say what happens in between the pixels. All it cares about is the values at the pixels. On the other hand, our model, like the blue curve, if you only give it data at a lower resolution, it still gets the same trend as the green curve, which is also the ground truth, where uh, you know, you're following the fine scales more closely. But to that, if you add in physics, so the green curve takes both the data, it adds the constraints from physics at a finer resolution, you can perfectly capture the spectrum. And so this is what we call physics-informed learning. You know, there is just no internet out there that has all of the information of our physical world. Right? Instead, what we have is some amount of data. In the case of weather, we have satellites, so we can record data, but that's only at a limited resolution. But you also know mathematical equations. We know like heat conservation. If the sun is heating up the atmosphere, we know that there should be that balance. We have fluid dynamics of how winds move. So we can capture all of those effects in addition to the data, and that's really critical for scientific research, right? Because if you really want to say that, you know, I don't want to just do fluid dynamics on the training data or the distribution of the training data, but I want to go beyond. I want to do it in a different regime. For instance, I want to ask what happens under climate change? And we've never seen it because that hasn't occurred. And if you want to go do that, what I call extrapolation, go beyond what is seen, you need to capture knowledge from physics and data alone is not enough. And that's what we are able to do with neural operators. So I won't have time here to go into all the details of the architectures. It turns out to be a rich class. So any neural network you can think of, you know, think of transformers, think of convolutional neural networks, think of graph neural networks. You can make very simple modifications to that and turn that into a neural operator. Right? So this is not entirely a new class of architectures. It's really a way of thinking on how we can take existing architectures and make them continuous. And so that way it can handle multiple resolutions. And also it turns out like some of the signal processing techniques like Fourier transforms end up being a special case of uh, global convolution. So convolutional neural networks are local, but you can do more global convolution. And it's also a special case of transformers if you assume shift invariant kernels. It's a detail, but there's a nice way of unifying all kinds of neural architectures for science. And that's what Neural Operator Library does. Uh, there'll be a poster later today in the evening, uh, Jean Kosefi and David Pitt will be presenting, where we go into those details. And that's all, of course, in PyTorch. You know, that's why we are here. And it's open and uh, it uh, has a lot of contributions. So I encourage you to go check it out. We had the latest version release. 
So let me now show you some of the success stories of what has happened with neural operators. Uh, to me, the big one is weather models. We did the first AI-based high-resolution weather model way back in 2021, where there was a lot of skepticism of what AI could do for science, right? Because there have been decades of research that has gone into weather modeling. And here we come, our first attempt, where we had the public data set, which is great. You know, we had the data set of 40 years of weather, and then we could train this neural operator model and it could capture phenomena like these atmospheric rivers, which are very global, long range. And not only that, do that tens of thousands of times faster. So this speed means now weather forecasting is not just in the realm of big supercomputers. We were the first to permissively open source this, again, in PyTorch. It's Apache license, so lots of startups, big companies, everybody running on these models. ECMWF is hosting these models. So weather scientists have been looking at what predictions AI models give for the past two years, and there's so much trust built because hurricanes, uh, end up being done more accurately and earlier compared to traditional models in many cases. And now in the latest version of ForecastNet 3, we can now have guaranteed or, you know, like we've calibrated the model, meaning extreme weather events like hurricanes, what you really care about is the risk assessment, right? What is the probability it'll hit the coast of Florida? And that is a tail event, it needs careful probabilistic calibration, it needs large statistical ensembles, which the speed of these models enable. And we can do all that very thoroughly, carefully. We collaborate with weather scientists, such as from Lawrence Berkeley Group, and those help us make sure we add in the right constraints, we add in the right scientific tools while making them also learnable. So that's a great success story. To me, the other big aspect is design, right? So AI being able to come up with new designs, whether it's medical devices, like we designed a new medical catheter that reduces bacterial contamination by a hundredfold by having AI that understands fluid dynamics. We can do much better mask design in inverse lithography, which is a you know, big critical aspect of all the semiconductors that powers AI. And we can do that much better with AI than what humans had the intuition. You know, even things like quantum dot for quantum devices, gates are highly nonlinear, very non-intuitive, not something humans are good at doing, but AI understands the forward model of how quantum effects work and then can do the inverse design because the model is differentiable and can get you new insights, new kinds of designs that were not attempted before. And what is really interesting here is, you know, the big bottleneck is the physical cost, right? To be able to fabricate chips, go to the lab, do this trial and error. And AI is now able to overcome that because we can now come up with valid designs. You can also check for the physical validity of the designs because we have partial differential equations. You can em embed them into the learning itself through physics-informed neural operators. So you have much more confidence of a design you're going and fabricating, uh, so you minimize the trial and error. And that's what the uh, neural operators gives us, that ability to capture that physical world accurately and keep all the physics information uh, for uh, being able to come up with valid designs. So that's on the part of understanding the world that is continuous. I think Jan Lacun also likes to say how it's not just tokens, right? So uh, I'm not sure, but I think many others are thinking not just at the token level or at a discrete level, the world is continuous, and that's what these models are able to do. But going back to also the discrete world, I think there are some very interesting aspects that can help science. And that's like when it comes to proving theorems, right, mathematical reasoning. And to me, this so-called path of AGI, like how do you get to AGI, requires us to not just reason, 
but to be able to verify that because if you're doing long proofs like open conjectures which one of them we are attempting and it's really interesting how AI is able to come up with new insights you know we are not able to fully <laughs> tackle that conjecture because lots of mathematicians have done this this is core research this is not just a math olympiad where you know the answer is always there it just needs to be found uh, but we've seen now sparks of that reasoning even in really hard math problems and for that you cannot do it just with language models we really need to be able to verify proof steps and that's where lean as a formal language has had such a great impact and again i want to advertise our efforts in this the lean dojo was the first open source framework again in pytorch that enabled combining lean and language models and we'll be soon doing a public release of our latest tools we're taking again from the community all the amazing ways people have done proof steps we've also had our own research here and put them together so we'll be making a public release soon where you will see that now research level math can be tackled uh, with the use of this so it becomes really a co-pilot to mathematicians and at the same time we can do advanced rl techniques to see how well you can get uh, you know these to solve not just olympiad level but research level problems so lastly, in the remaining few minutes or rather seconds, I want to quickly touch upon the hardware part of it, right? So I gave a longer talk at MLSIS earlier this year, where really now the focus is not just making the hardware more efficient or faster, or not just at the inference level, but also at the training level, but to rethink the algorithms themselves. You know, as somebody who works on the foundations, you know, do we really need to do SGD or Adam, you know, can we rethink that optimizer? Can we make that more efficient, right? Make hardware as part of the constraint of algorithmic design. And so for all of this, the big bottleneck is memory, right? So I'm an advisor to SK Hynix, one of the premium HPM manufacturers that goes into NVIDIA chips and many others. And memory is really the true bottleneck because if the memory is small locally, that's when you need bandwidth, you need to distribute. And in these modern models, we are getting them to be more memory bottlenecked rather than compute bottlenecked, right? We haven't reached the roof line if you think of long context now. And of course, when it comes to the physical world, like with neural operators, we are dealing with data that is in four dimensions, three dimensions in time. And they also need to be in a fine grid to capture those fine scale physical effects. And so you're thinking of like starting with context length in the billions, if not hundreds of billions. So no transformer out there is able to handle that. And so we are thinking of alternative architectures to neural operator, with neural operators such as the Fourier version of it. But we also need the hardware aspect on how to make that efficient. So one of the works that was done in collaboration with Meta, you know, my student Jawe is now part of Meta, so he started when he was student uh, in my group, where we showed that you can, you know, during pre-training as well, really improve memory requirements because the gradients end up being in a low rank subspace. The weights are not, right, that's lower. For fine tuning, weights being low rank is sufficient, but not for pre-training because that's too limiting in the expressivity of the model. And so we, simple notion, but really now that has taken off their, you know, latest version of this, it's uh, part of the PyTorch community and Hugging Face. So that has a big impact of being able to keep the perplexity while greatly improving the memory requirements. And so in the latest work that will appear at NeurIPS in our group, we showed how you can do that also in reasoning models. Uh, because it makes sense if you're doing chain of thought, a lot of thought is just either redundant, irrelevant, right? Humans don't think this way. Or oh, let me think every step and keep on a chain, right? We tend to be much more quick in our intuitions. And so can you have the model not fill up the KV cache? So you become much more intelligent in what is relevant and important and correct and only fill up the KV cache with that. And so it not only saves memory, it actually improves accuracy. And so that's kind of my big message when it comes to hardware aware, hardware efficient learning, that lots of free lunches to be had. 
right? It's not a trade-off between accuracy versus hardware efficiency because we rethink the algorithms themselves and that's an exciting future to have. So I'll conclude here by saying, you know, think of problems beyond just the standard language models. It's a very crowded and saturated space. The future is really bright for AI and science coming together in an integrated way, all the way at the algorithmic level. And I hope we can have more of the community participate in this. Thank you. <laughs>